Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of the Podiatry Legends podcast. With me today is Dr. Jeffrey Jensen, and he is the Dean of the Arizona College of Pediatric Medicine at Glendale, Arizona, and he's the host of the Dean's Chat podcast. Jeffrey, how are you doing? Doing wonderful. I'll Tyson, just call you. For I'll, on your show. No, I'll just call you Jeff because I know you don't mind being called Jeff. First names are the way to go, Tyson. Okay, so I want to. So you're the Dean of the Arizona College of Pediatric Medicine which I think is very cool. And because I mentioned that I go to Arizona every year. So I just love that whole desert sort of environment. But I want to go back a little bit further. You did your Bachelor of Science at University of Wisconsin, 1985. Why podiatry? What made you decide that podiatry? Did you know you were going to do podiatry before you did the undergraduate degree? No, I did not, Tyson. I didn't decide to go into podiatric medicine until I was working on my master's degree at at San Diego State in exercise physiology. Okay. But I was well versed in podiatry because our family had a family podiatrist where I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin. And he had done my mom's bunions and hammer toes and neuromas and he made orthotics for all the long distance runners. So I knew about podiatry. I just hadn't connected myself becoming a podiatrist yet. So what made the switch go off then? So when I was working on my master's degree, I was taking these upper level courses with all the pre-med students, pre-dental students, and I was really doing well in them. And then I was watching some of my colleagues in exercise physiology struggling with the job market. And uh, one day, I, or one week, I went back to Wisconsin to visit my parents. And then I called Dr. Hummel, Ed Hummel was his name. Yeah. And I asked him if I could come and visit and shadow him and see what he does on a day-to-day -day basis. And that was the deciding factor for me. I knew I wanted to go into podiatric medicine. Okay, that's cool. So you were studying Wisconsin. Where were you originally from? Where was, where's home? Home is Wisconsin for me. Okay, there's Wisconsin. Okay. Yep. And then my wife and I, wife-to-be, I should say, met in Madison. And then we ended up transferring to Wisconsin Oshkosh, where we both got our undergraduate degrees. And we wanted to continue our education. So we moved to California and went to San Diego State. And uh, that's when I decided I wanted to go back and take some of those re required courses, organic chemistry, physics, yeah. things like that, that I hadn't had. And then I went up to San Francisco for an interview because the California College of Podiatric Medicine is in San Francisco. And uh, they accepted me. And then we moved to San Francisco. I never in a million years would have thought I'd live in San Francisco, California. Yeah, I was in Wisconsin last year, first time. Oh, went yeah. to my first baseball game. Oh, good. The Brewers. And it was Brewers. fun. Yeah, I've got my Brewers t-shirt and yeah. it was so much fun. But yeah, Wisconsin, it was cold. Yeah. It was so really cold. We, we, we love to go back to Wisconsin in the summertime. Yeah. But in the wintertime, you can't beat Arizona or Florida for sure. So anyway, so you've gone from Wisconsin. You've gone to San Francisco, California College of Pediatric Medicine. You've graduated from there in 1991. 91, yep. So... Once you graduate, where did you do your residency? So in our profession here in the States, Tyson, we have the opportunity to do some rotations. They call them audition rotations or clerkships. Oh, so okay. you have an opportunity to go around the country and do rotations for a month at different hospitals. And I, one of my rotations was in Detroit, Michigan. And I had an opportunity to go there for a month and I really liked it. And so I was hoping that they would choose me to be a resident down the road. Yeah. And they did. And so next thing, my wife and I were loading up the rider moving truck and going from San Francisco to Detroit, Michigan. So with that rotation, I haven't heard anyone mention that before about the month. month. So how many, how long do you have to do that for? Or do you just keep doing that until someone offers you a residency? No, it's actually part of the curriculum. So what happens now, my students in the end of their third year can take two months and do rotations like that. Okay. And then they take the first six months of their fourth year. And they also do rotations around the country because in January of their fourth year, right? They're about what, four months away from graduating. They do residency interviews and then they put it into a computer program. And then in March, they find out where they're going to do their residency program. Okay. Oh, I want to go back one step. When you were at the California College of Pediatric Medicine, what were the famous names that were there when you were there? Oh my gosh, you're going to love this. So in our surgery department, Dr. Josh Gerbert was there. Yep. Josh wrote the Bunyan book. 
Also, Joel Clark was there. Steve Palladino was there. Bill Jenkins was there. That's the surgery department. And then in the medicine department, Dr. Jim Stavosky was there. Also, I think Dr. Palladino, Steve Palladino worked there. And then, of course, in biomechanics realm, you'll recognize some of these names. Dr. Val Massey yep. taught in our, our courses. Dr. Jack Morris taught. Uh, <laughs> That's Kirby right. came down, of course. Yeah. Yeah, it was just a, if you go through the history of podiatric biomechanics, San Francisco is kind of a hotbed, right? It's like the founding area. And so when you, oh, doctor, how could I forget this? Dr. John Weed taught my first biomechanics course. Yes. And and then we had to then we had to decipher that and figure out what everything meant. So was, was Richard Blake around your era as well? Dr. Blake, during that time, he wasn't teaching at the school, but he was still local. Yeah. He was still in San Francisco. So I got to see him lecture a couple of times, but he was partners with Ron Velmassi in their practice also. Okay. So I got to know Rich Blake over the years, though, and he was on one of my podcasts maybe six yeah, months he's ago. Yeah, been, he's been on this one as well earlier on, and super nice guy, just a super nice guy. Way ahead of his time. Before you and I were doing podcasts, Rich Blake was on YouTube getting 5,000 views on things like how to stretch your Achilles or how to deal with plantar <laughs> right? He was way ahead of his time. Yeah, and that's what I've really enjoyed doing this podcast too, is some of the people I've had on the podcast, these have been people that I've read their papers, their books, I've watched their videos, yeah, over my career. And then to actually have them on the podcast is, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And the funny thing is you learn things that you never would have found out reading their books or chapters or their articles. So yeah, this is a personal element of podcasting that's a lot of fun, I think. Yeah, and just, you dig into things that, like you said, that you, they would never write in a book because it's irrelevant, but it just comes out in a conversation. Absolutely. That's okay. great. I'd love to. Okay, you've zipped over to Detroit. You're doing your residency there. How long did you stay in Detroit for? At the time, two-year surgical residencies were standard. Now they're three years for everybody, right? But yeah. Early 90s, I, got, I had the opportunity to do a two-year surgical program, and it was really neat because when I went there, I got to also work with people that were absolute leaders in our profession. Uh, Dr. Bill Todd, Dr. Guy Pup, Dr. Gary Kaplan, Earl Kaplan's son. Earl was yeah. the father of podiatric surgery. And uh, Kern Hospital, before it was named Kern, it was Civic Hospital. And Civic Hospital is the birthplace of podiatric surgery. So if okay. you go through all of all the tree, if you will, of surgeons in the United States of America, all the way back into late 50s, early 60s, most everybody came through Kern Hospital. You didn't know a Dr. Leonard Winston by any chance, did you? No, I don't know Leonard no? Winston. Okay, no, he was from around that area. He was the first, when I graduated, the year I graduated was 88 in 1989. I'm on the Gold Coast. I'm at a bar waiting for a friend. All of a sudden, I'm talking to this young American guy there. We're chatting away, and he said, what do you do? I said, oh, podiatrist. He goes, my dad's a podiatrist. And I said, I'll be buggered. So he, then his dad comes in and his dad was Leonard Winston and he was, the association had brought him over oh, in combination with Rockport at the time. Rockport had just been released and they were doing tours all around the country. And so him and I got on like a house on a fire. So I hung around these guys oh, for about four days on the Gold Coast. And that was my first exposure to an American podiatrist. Oh, very good. And it, it, it was an absolute eye opener and he left me all these different magazines that you guys had in the States that we did not have here. He got me, got subscriptions for me for different magazines as well. So it was, yeah, right place at the right time. I was talking with Luke Ciccinelli. Do you know Luke? No. So yeah, Luke went over to Australia and did some teaching maybe in the last 15 years or so. But I think it's great that we all have these common grounds. You know, podiatric medicine deals with the anatomy and surgical and non-surgical management of foot and ankle issues that kind of brings all of us together you know yeah and that's why i have the quote on my back wall yeah the next connection you make could be the one that changes your life there you go and Case i honestly point. believe that's why you can do things online it's fine but you need to attend live events attending live events the people you meet and the people you have a drink with around the bar afterwards i don't know those connections can last a lifetime it's uncanny and you never know when it's going to happen, do you? Yeah, I know. Okay, so let's get back onto your story. So you're in Detroit. You did your two-year residency there. Did you stay longer or did you go back for warmer weather? No, in about the 
last six months of my residency program, I was looking for jobs, right? And I had a couple offers. I had one offer in Philadelphia, one to stay in Detroit, one in San Diego, California, and then one in Denver, Colorado. And when it was all said and done, we decided to move to Denver, where I joined a doctor whose practice was essentially clinical research. Yeah. I don't know if Dr. Garrett Mulder. Garrett really was a leader in the early days of wound care. Before wound care was mainstream in podiatric medicine, he was working with all the big companies at the time, Smith & Nephew, Johnson & Johnson, Convitec, all the companies that were looking at putting wound care dressings on the market and then doing lots of different clinical trials for new drugs and things, synthetic skin. I, we did some of the original studies on dermograft and aplograft. So I was vaulted into this world of, yes, I wanted to practice podiatric medicine. Yes, I wanted to grow a practice, of course. But I had the opportunity to do clinical trials with Dr. Mulder. Oh, uh, that, and really that makes sense now because there's a few other things that I, I dug up about you. So that yeah. makes sense now how you ended up down that yeah. path. So I'll let you continue. This is interesting. Yes. So the reason, the way I met Dr. Mulder was I did a rotation. Remember I was telling you about those clerkship rotations? Yeah, yeah. rotations. I spent a month in Denver and I met Dr. Mulder and I wrote him a letter near the end of my residency. And I said, I hope you remember me, you know, all that kind of goes. And he said, yeah, I would love, I need an associate. Come on out. We'll do research together. It was fascinating. And he introduced me into an incredible world of, of clinical trials and research that really paid off a lot and, and kind of like the quote on your wall, you just never know when something's going to change your life. Yeah. How many rotations did you end up doing? I think we did four that year. We had four, okay. but now yeah. we've got the opportunity to do eight. But see, some of our rotations when I was in San Francisco were in the Bay Area. So they worked in a similar fashion. Yeah. Um, but it's amazing. You, you got to reach out and meet really successful people and yeah, some of it rubs off on you sometimes. I know, obviously it did, because I read that you've got 10 United States patents. Yeah, it's actually 14 now. Oh, um, well, they've got to update the information that I dug up then. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. You know what I found, Tyson, I was practicing and seeing patients and following what I thought were great clinical protocols and things. And then I was realizing that some of the clinical trials that I was participating on as an yeah. investigator they weren't really delivering to the patient what we were hoping they were going to deliver. And so I found an avenue where I could do National Institute of Health grants, where if I were to develop this idea, it could be potentially patentable, right? An innovative idea that does a few things, right? It's something that, that will improve quality of care, decrease cost of care. If you look at those and you can invent them, I... I was very fortunate. And that's like anything when you, the hardest patent to get is your first patent, right? Yeah. Once you've got the, once you have the template down and you're inventing things and you're coming up with great ideas that you think are great anyway, the marketplace might not think they're great, but <laughs> it, it, it's a process of putting the patents together and the provisional patents and non-provisional patents. So yeah, I've got 14 right now and I've got two more pending and I don't know. I don't know if I've got any great innovative ideas left in me, to be honest with you, Tyson. Like you said, the first one's the hard one because the yeah. thing is we all have ideas. Everybody has ideas. It's then taking some action on that and moving forward with it. But little did you realize that when you took that, when you went from Detroit to Colorado, which is also a very nice area, okay. is you didn't know that down the track from that job, you would end up having 14 patents. No, I never did. I don't know. We don't know what opportunities lie before us. Really? Yeah, and, and to give people an idea, your patents are based around medical innovations, addressing diabetic foot ulcers, offloading, post-surgical care, fracture care. Yeah, and then I got one recently. I was working with Dr. Jason Hamm, and we were working on a kind of insole materials that we use yeah. for shoes. And it was with Adam Landsman, also out of Boston, and my son, Danny, who was a soccer player. We took some insole materials, and we modified them to go into a headband and we patented a, a, head, a protector for soccer players that would minimize the potential for concussions and okay. other head problems. So anyways, that was a fun thing too, but that <laughs> wasn't a... really in my scope. Oh. Yeah. That's living proof, Tyson, that once you know how to get patents, it's easy to pull, flip the switch and apply for another one. There you... Yeah. I, I remember when I was at uh, university, I designed the sole of a football boot. Because when I was playing football, 
under my first MPJ, you should just get destroyed from the metal tags that used to come up. So I yeah. redesigned the sole. And after I did that, and then I, I had no idea what I was doing. So I, I then sent some things off to a couple of different shoe companies about, hey, have a look at this design. Now, none of them ever got back to me. But it wasn't long after that that some shoe designs came out a little bit different. I'm like, hmm, I wonder if. You know what? Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you, right? Yeah, I know. That's, that's what they always say. Remember that? That was on MASH. Remember when yeah. Hawkeye Pierce said that to Major Burns? He said, stop being paranoid. Well, I wouldn't be paranoid if everyone wasn't out to get me. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, so the story you're sharing yeah. is a story that I've had friends experience also. They've brought technologies. They've actually sold their patented technology to shoe companies. And then the shoe company, they will put that technology on the back burner and bring it out later for a future date. So yeah, yeah you got to be careful. You got to protect your intellectual property. You know? And yeah, that, but that was something I learned from that. And throughout my career, there were two other times I was burnt by other companies where I had an idea about something, approached them without protecting it first. And all three times going back to the one as a student and two times when I should have known better, it got burnt each time. So it is one of those things. If you, I think if you've got an idea, go and talk to an attorney who specializes in that area, get yourself protected and then start sharing it with people. Don't do it beforehand. Well, for anybody listening, you can do a non-provisional patent fairly quickly and for very little money. And it gives you a placeholder for your idea. Yeah. And then once you've got that placeholder with a non-provision with a provisional patent, it gives you a year to improve upon it. And then you can apply formally for the patent. So that way you can get out and talk to people and you can advance your technology without fear of losing it. So there is a method to the madness. We're not trained that in in school. No. Is there to teach about patent law or anything. Yeah. And sometimes too, the ideas you have may not even be within podiatry. It might be something that you just see that you go, well, I can improve upon that or I have an idea about that. But anyway, so when you were doing all this, did you have any contact with David Armstrong through the oh, process yeah. since, oh, yeah. You, yeah, the diabetes high risk feet? Oh yeah. So when I was, when I graduated from the California College of Podiatric Medicine, David Armstrong was about to start his third year there. Yeah. And then when I was at Kern Hospital in Michigan, when I was leaving the residency program, David Armstrong was coming in. So okay. David and I have I, David and I know each other really well, and uh, we've worked together over the years. And in fact, his daughter just graduated from my college in the Arizona College. This oh okay, yeah, he was back on episode thirty four. Oh yeah, yeah, way back, yeah, and he's done yeah. a few things in his career as well, hasn't he? <laughs> I always tell a great story about David when he was a student, he was rotating at our residency program Yeah, and he was soon to come there. And we used to do an NBA fantasy league, fantasy draft for basketball. And we used to write all the picks on the chalkboard and David shows up and he opens up his backpack and he pulls out a computer. Now, mind you, this is 1992, right? Yeah. He pulls out a computer, right, creates an Excel spreadsheet of the day puts all the picks in, goes over, plugs it into the printer and prints out the end results for us. And so David's always been ahead of his time. David's brilliant. Absolutely. It was funny because when he was on the podcast, one of the first things he said to me was, yeah, don't tell anyone, but I'm not really that smart. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm that, thinking, that, yeah, right. Yeah. He's self-deprecating. There's no doubt. Oh yeah. And that's, that's what was, he was probably, he was one of the f earlier guests that I actually heard on the podcast that when he was coming on, I was a little bit nervous because you're thinking this guy's got a big name. Yeah. Everybody in the profession knows who he is. Don't stuff this one up, Tyson. <laughs> don't, don't do the interview and then say something really inappropriate that he goes, do not air that. But he ended up just being a really down to earth, nice guy. Yeah. All you have to do is ask David a question and then step back and he'll fill all the space. He's, yeah, it was he, good. He, lot yeah. he's a great he's he comes from a family of podiatrists also so david's a second generation and alexandria's third generation so david's done just tremendous things for our profession we're certainly all indebted to him for sure okay so with your research you did in the the patents the 14 patents ahead then you were the senior director of research at barry university so how did you what was the process of going from colorado to barry university yeah, this is one of those moments like you have in the back of that quote up there. Yeah. Um, so we had a residency program in Colorado and I was one of the faculty in the residency program. And we would meet 
that all of the doctors that were in the residency would meet once a month to talk about our program. And what the residency director said, Hey, Jeff, did you know that there's a Dean position open in Miami at Barry university? And I didn't, but I went home and I looked it up and I thought, wow, that really sounds like a neat opportunity. So I wrote a quick little cover letter and my CV and I sent it off to Miami because I had no intention of becoming the Dean, right? I was in practice and be careful what you ask for Tyson. You never know, right? <laughs> you get a phone call then there's an interview. And next thing you know, my wife and I were sitting in the living room with our four kids saying, dad's got an opportunity potentially to be the Dean. Everybody, we gave everybody a veto vote Tyson because we lived in Evergreen, Colorado. It was beautiful, but we all decided to make the move to Miami and I was the dean there for four years, and I became the senior director of research after that for the entire university. And that's everything's a little bit complicated, right? My parents were getting older. My mom had dementia. My father was having some vascular dementia. Barry University was so good to me, Tyson. Even though I stepped down as the dean, they made me the senior director of research, and then I could take care of my parents and come back to Miami one week a month to fulfill my obligations in person. Oh, but it good. was, I was working remotely before it was cool. They were really <laughs> good to me. So that's how I became the senior director of research. But I learned a lot. In fact, some of the research we were doing was on dementia. So it was very pertinent to my life, even though I'm a foot and ankle doctor, right? Okay. So the research wasn't all just podiatry related. No, but we did some really cool research down there, Tyson. Within the School of Podiatric Medicine, I was also involved with the PA program. And we developed an extending extender program for the PA school, physician assistant school, where we were training like you know, via Zoom, like we're doing yeah. PAs in the Virgin Islands to become doctors. And then we also had a big grant from the military. It was to look at multi-drug resistant organisms, which are pertinent not only in, in wounds in the field in war times, but they're also pertinent to our patients, right? With diabetic foot infections. So it was a topical application of nitric oxide, which is a universal antimicrobial. And it's a very small molecule. So if you put it under a little bit of pressure, it penetrates tissues and gets to the leading edge of infection. So that was a really cool study. We got a couple million dollars to do that. So was that how you developed one of those patents? Yeah, I've got a couple patents around that. And we were really looking to build out the company and get investment money right about the time COVID hit. And then a lot of funding, whether it was private equity or angel funding or venture capital, a lot of that funding stalled during COVID, of course. Okay. Oh, go back a step. When you were back in Colorado, is that where you met Jim McDonald? Yes. Yeah. I was yes. the clerkship director. So I would bring students in from all the different schools and colleges of podiatric medicine for that month rotation. Right. Yeah. So I was in, in charge of the students when they spent a month with us. And that's how I met Jim. Okay. And, then, and if anyone's listened to the podiatry marketing podcast that I do with big Jim Mack, that's who we're yeah. talking about. Small world Tyson. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is a small world. And I love the way it all sort of weaves, weaves together. So how did you, so after doing that research, did you go from there to Arizona or were there a couple of things in between? No, um, I was in Miami for seven years. Yeah. And I was quite happy. I loved Florida, doing a lot of deep sea fishing and a lot of fun things. Miami to Arizona, completely different because the beaches in Arizona are not very good. Just to point that out to people that haven't been to Arizona before. No, very rarely do people ask me about what I do, but they do ask me all the time. Which do you like more, Florida or Arizona? Because that's a big question. Where I mean, are people they're different. Tired? Totally like, different. Because it's exactly the same thing. I've said to my wife that if I ever lived in America for any reason, for an extended period of time, which I want to do, I want to do for a 12-month period, I said the yeah. two places I would live would either be Nevada or Arizona. They're the two places that I'd choose. Yep. Now, I live in the tropics, palm trees and, yeah, and tropical islands and coconuts, and but... I, I love that arid desert environment. It's so beautiful. You can hike, you can run trails, you can go fishing. You want to go skiing, you can go up to the mountains a couple hours away up in Flagstaff. It's an ideal area, Tyson. And when we moved here, I was thinking it was just going to be warm all the time. And what I didn't realize, and my daughter summed it up best. She said, Dad, Arizona is too hot in the summer and too cold in the winter. <laughs> and, and there's those extremes, right? Because it's yeah. the desert. Sometimes in the summer, I think this year we had 30 some days in a row over 110 degrees Fahrenheit. It was hot when I was there this year too. 
Yep. And then in the winter, like this time of year, it's in the 40s when we wake up in the morning and then it gets up to around 75 degrees. It's absolutely beautiful. I would recommend when you come here, it's September 15th and then leave June 15th. That's the way to go. <laughs> like I said to you, I go every year and yep. it's usually in October that, I, that we turn up and it's during the day, it can still be quite hot, but in the morning, it's really pleasant. For anybody that wants to come to Arizona, the sun shines about 330 days a year and there's no earthquakes, there's no hurricanes. It's just an outstanding area. It's a great place to live. Yeah. We're, and we're it's, super happy. Yeah, and interesting wildlife. I came across a rattlesnake and a bobcat having a fight. We said we're yeah. on this path and I saw the rattlesnake. I said, I'm going to go and have a look. So I ran up there. My friend Dave Freeze was following me and he kept yelling out, <laughs> telling me, don't get too close to the rattlesnake. He said, they can jump. And all of a sudden I stopped. He said, why did you stop? I said, there's a big cat looking at me. He said, it's not a mountain lion, is it? I said, no, it's just a bobcat. He goes, oh, don't pat the cat. Anyway, next thing, they're, they're starting to have a fight. And I'm watching this. And I said, how often does this happen? He said, yeah. oh, only in National Geographic. There you go. There you go. And here, yeah. I, Tyson, we've been here seven years now. It's our seventh year. And we've seen a bunch of snakes. We've seen javelinas. But it's just, it's so beautiful. If you don't harm them or if you're not aggressive with them, they're not going to be aggressive with you. And roadrunners. I didn't realize how small a roadrunner was. Yeah, because we all think of the roadrunner on the cartoon. Yeah, right? but they're only about oh, nine inches high, if that. Anyway, we should get back onto this. So you're now the Dean of Arizona College of Pediatric Medicine in Glendale, Arizona, which we will yep. catch up in 2024 when I come over. Yes, indeed. And you also have the, the podcast, Dean's Chat Podcast. How did that come about? What made you decide to do to actually do that particular podcast? So I had one of those experiences where I was invited to do the podcast at the studio in Scottsdale. And my son was starting a podcast and I was going to be his guinea pig. Yeah. So I said, sure, yeah, I'll come down. And as I was finishing the podcast, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, this is really cool because my job as a podcaster, my job is to bring in great guests. Mm. And then the studio does all the editing and they put all my everything together for me. So I quickly took a piece of paper, Tyson, and I thought, you know, you can do a year's program. They'll help you with 52 podcasts. And I thought, I wonder if I know 52 people. And on the back of a piece of paper in about two minutes, I wrote over 50 names of people in our profession that would be leaders, whether it's the American Podiatric Medical Association or different associations like the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons or the American Board of Podiatric Medicine. And then I thought to myself, then I could do deans of all the schools. I could do faculty. I could interview young practitioners, yeah. I could interview residents. Tyson, as you know, better than anybody, there's an unlimited supply of wonderful people to interview. Oh, I'm well in the 300s now. So Unbelievable. And there's never, like I've, had, I've had some people have come on multiple times, but there's never a shortage of, of guests. And everybody, oh. I say to everybody, everybody has a story if yeah. they're willing to just talk. Yeah. And if they don't think they have a story, I will dig it out of them. There you go. That's yeah. the key. What's interesting about all of it, Tyson, and sitting back and reflecting on the year, we're in this little niche, right? It's podiatric medicine. But within that niche, there's students, residents, practitioners, leaders, surgeons. Yeah. It just never ends. So there's all these little groups that you, you do a show and you reach out to them. And the people that watch one episode aren't the same people that watch the next one. So, oh, that's true. Yeah. Uh, I'm learning all of this. And uh, I'm again, my learning curve is vertical, right? I'm just loving it. I'm having so much fun. I have no, I just, I'm glad I stumbled onto podcasting. It's really been a great year for me and I'm looking forward to doing more. So you, you go into the actual studio itself and then from the studio, most of your guests are remote. They're not live in the studio with you, are they? They're live if they're in town for yeah. some reason or whether if it's somebody like my students or faculty, then of course they come into the studio, but most of them are Zoom meetings and I do most of them in almost all of them in the studio. Um, I'm not down in the studio today with you. I'm, I'm in my house, but yeah, uh, I've, I've found that if I'm in charge of the technology, there's a tremendous a chance that something's going to go wrong. Right? <laughs> um, and so if I'm in charge of asking questions and inviting great guests, I can handle that. Yeah. But I, my skill set hasn't evolved to the point where I can like edit and things yet. As long as you don't have to push the buttons and, and you know what, and this is the part I enjoy. Like I 
organize the guests, we get everything all planned in, I do the recording, I do the edit, I get it out there. And I actually, I love the editing process. Mm-hmm. And on my old podcast, I did over 200 episodes. This one's been now over 300. So I've done well over 500 episodes that I've edited myself. And people say, why don't you outsource it to somebody else? But they don't realize how much I learn from every guest when I'm doing the editing. So we're talking now, which is great. And I'm learning a lot talking to you today. But when I sit down and do the edit and I go through it slowly, I hear so many things I didn't hear the first time. And sometimes I sit there going, should have asked a question there. But anyway, I didn't. And But then when it's all finished, sometimes I'll go from doing a, a walk, taking the dog for a walk, I'll put the episode on and listen to it again just to see what everybody else is hearing. Yep. And, yeah, so I will just keep doing the editing process. I like that. That's interesting you say that. Two comments. One, you're the legend, really. You know. <laughs> <laughs> the second comment is, it's always interesting because when I finish a podcast, I'm always critical of myself. I could have done better. And then I'm like, oh, God, I should have done this. But every time I go back and listen to it, I was like, oh, that's better than I thought it was going to be. Because yeah. just like you said, you miss things when you're doing it live that you catch on the second or third review. Yeah, I've never posted anything up on YouTube or on the podcast channels without listening to it completely first, even after the edits and things. So Yeah, it's funny because sometimes I'll, I'll listen back. And I'll have a question in my head. Did I ask it? Because I can't remember. Yep. And then as you're listening back to it, then all of a sudden I do ask the question. I go, oh, my God, thank you. Because I'm thinking someone could be driving the car at the moment thinking, come on, Tyson, make sure you ask this question. So Wait. probably I would say 95% of the time I do ask the question, even when I'm listening back to it the second time that I did. But occasionally you miss the odd thing. I have to admit, when I go back and listen to some of my earliest ones, I was super nervous, Tyson. I'm used to lecturing (laughs) and traveling around, giving talks and things. Yeah. But for some reason, the day of my first podcast, I was super nervous. And I was interviewing the dean the same day I interviewed two people. I interviewed the dean, Dr. Stephanie Wu from the Scholl College in Chicago, and then the dean from Miami, uh, Dr. Rob Snyder. And I was like, I had an upset stomach. I'm like, oh my gosh, why is this? And I was rather scripted, to be quite honest with you. I didn't want to make mistakes. I want everybody to look good. I still do, of course, but I'm just a little more comfortable in my own skin. It's like anything. The more you do, perhaps the better you get. See, that's really, I think it's really good for people to hear that here you are, a podiatrist, this amazing career, you've had 14 patents and you go to start a podcast and you are nervous. (laughs) I was. (laughs) And you get up and lecture in front of all these students and here you are going to do a podcast and you are nervous. That's great to hear because I was exactly the same. Were you really? Oh, I remember but the first, in my old podcast, I remember episode number five, which no one can get anymore because I pushed the wrong button somewhere and, and I lost. I, I've got them all, but I, they're not actually online anywhere. It was the first guest I had that wasn't someone who was a friend. And I remember doing the introduction and my voice was just crashing and burning as I'm doing the intro. Nobody mentioned it. Nobody said they could even hear it, but I could actually hear the tension in my voice. And I did. I used to actually have a couple of questions down in case I got lost to keep me on track. Now, yeah, I know who the guest is. I know what they've done. I have. I do not have one question planned because I just want to see where the conversation goes. Right. But I'm learning from you, Tyson. I've been getting like CVs and I make scribble little notes. Don't forget to ask about this. Cause you know how sometimes you go on tangents and you get oh, yeah. in the discussion. And so I try to make sure I circle around, but I don't know. I think I'm getting a little bit better at it. I'm certainly enjoying it. And I think that's half the battle. If you love what you're doing, you're going to get better at it. In order to get the, everything right, it takes practice and time. And in fact, when I was giving my, doing my first couple of uh, podcasts, I was up like at five o'clock in the morning walking around doing my intro like I tried to do it as many times as I could because it didn't feel natural to me as soon as the camera was on me I was I didn't I just felt different yeah. if you're giving a lecture at a meeting nobody's filming it nobody's going to be calling you on it you can give be very free with what you're saying the second that people are documenting it like we are it's out for the public consumption and that 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 brings in a certain element of stress I don't mm. feel it anymore but I did early on like you. Yeah, I think one of the things that really helped me overcome any sort of public speaking every now, like 2019, was it in uh, Liverpool at a foot and ankle show over there, thousand people in the crowd. 
I had just had to get him to do this 15 minute talk. And I remember sitting down, you know, standing there, ready to go up on stage, getting introduced, looking at a thousand people, and just thinking to myself, I wish I'd worn brown pants because <laughs> I, was, I was like, my God. But I got up there and I thought, you cannot beat good preparation and practice. It's just rehearsing. If you rehearse enough, it will just come to you. And it's get through the first 60 seconds. If you can make the crowd laugh or just do something that relaxes you, as soon as you get through that 60 seconds, the rest just flows. That And that's what I keep telling myself. No matter where I speak now, I know I'm going to be nervous. 60 seconds. I'm just going to get through the first 60 seconds. Yeah, I've been asked to give presentations on topics I didn't feel like I was really knowledgeable or expert on. And I usually turn those down. Because that requires a lot of research and a lot of, yeah. a, really a ton of preparation. And all of us can talk about things. You know, oftentimes you get asked, are there a few subjects that you could talk about where you wouldn't, for 15 minutes, where you don't have to take any notes or any slides and you could be an authority on that? And I try to stick with uh, in that narrow area. For me, That's really good advice. That's great yeah. advice. Because yeah, when I've heard so. people say that they don't want to do public speaking, they go, oh, yeah, they're scared about what they're going to say. Like, I wouldn't get up in front of a podiatry group and talk about anything scientific because I would feel I'm out of my element and there's people that know that subject far better than what I do. Put me in front of a rotary group and talk about heel pain, I'll kill it because I know more about that than that particular group. So it's picking your topic for the audience, but put me in front of a thousand people and say, hey, show them some demonstration how to use semi-compressed felt to make different padding, I'll kill it because yeah. I know I'm really good at that. It was like when you asked me about the patent process earlier, yeah. I could go, talk about that for an hour. It'd be really fun. But if you ask me some, something that I don't, it's not in my wheelhouse, it's not there. So you're only good at what you know and what you're passionate about. And then the other thing I was going to mention Tyson is, and this is an old adage, I think, but the two hardest things to do and the things that people are most afraid of are speaking in public and raising money. <laughs> I remember seeing this thing once and it said, this is one of the talks I did once and it was, Two biggest f fears. First one is public speaking. The second one is death by fire. So well, people would rather die in a fire than do public speaking. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Although I, I'll tell you, I've met so many people that you start, you meet them, whether it's in, in a meeting or at work or if it was a patient, you get them talking about something they're passionate about, they could give a lecture on it. No problem. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh, and, and I think, and that's why I like I love getting people on the podcast who say to me, oh, I'm not a legend. I've got nothing to say, but I know enough about them or I've done a little bit of digging that I go, yeah, you've got a story in there, which I think people will learn something from. And nearly every person when they come on here and they finish, when I press stop, they go, oh, that went so fast. And that was so much better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And they say it's fun too, which is yeah. Great. Oh, it's, oh, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. That's why I keep yeah. doing it. It's just... It's fun. <laughs> if it's not fun, you probably should find something else to do. Nobody nobody works as a part of a life sentence. It's something, right? I love being the dean. I love doing the podcast. I love being with students. I love educating. So it's not hard work. It's not work, actually. Yeah. So where you are now in Arizona, you think this is where your career will finish here? Or do you think you'll just keep going until you drop? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that, but I do know... That if I'm in, intrigued and I've, I'm curious by nature, I like to do things. My job's fabulous right now. I get to interview great students that are undergrads and bring them into our college. Our college is phenomenal in terms of board scores and things. And I will have fabulous faculty and lots of support from the university. So I'm not in any way, shape or form looking for something. I've learned a long time ago to never say never, Tyson, to potential opportunity. No, I think it's good advice. Hey, a question about the university though. So if somebody in America wanted to do podiatry, they've done that yeah. undergraduate degree, do they apply to like four or five different schools and then the school looks at their marks and, and everything else and then chooses them or do they choose the school? How does that actually work? So, so uh, many of the professions in the United States has a, have a central application service. Yeah. So Tyson, let's say you you went back and took all your prerequisites or your son or somebody or, or daughter. Yeah. And then they said, I want to be a podiatrist. There's a centralized application service 
where they upload all of their transcripts and their medical college admission test scores, the MCAT it's called. Yep. And then from that central application service, they can designate which colleges that they want to apply to. Okay. So, so for example, when I was coming through, I, I, we did, I don't know that we really had that back in the 90s, but for today, students can go on and apply to all 11 uh, colleges of podiatric medicine. I should, let me temper that a little bit. They can apply to 10 of them because the college in Texas has its own application service. They don't participate in with everybody else. But that said, it's really easy then for a student, right? If you want to be a podiatrist, you just click the buttons and then all of your information will go to those colleges. And then it's incumbent upon the colleges to reach out to the student and set up interviews and you know, whether they come to the campus or we do it on Zoom like we're doing here, we're always looking for fit. You know, you know, Tyson, what I typically say to students is, look, if, you, if you're passionate about podiatry and you're smart, we give you an interview because you've done well, and then you have few distractions, right? You, If you come to our school, you got to be all in. You know, it's not like you're mm -hmm. going to be working a part-time job or something. If you put those three things together you're well on your way and then you have a tremendous opportunity to get a, a, tr a great residency program. And it, you can't really take it lightly. It's an honor and a privilege to do surgery on fellow human beings. So it's a process. It's a seven-year process. But um, I, from what I've seen, I'm so proud of my students. I'm going to meetings now and students that I had in 10, 12 years ago are giving lectures at the big meetings and I'm super proud of them. And they're advancing our profession. You got to pass on the, pass the torch, right? Yeah, I think it's great because it's like I always say that I, I know that I'll never find the cure for cancer. I've said this multiple times on the podcast. I said, but I hope one day I do something or I, I do something that inspires somebody else. And it could be this particular episode. Someone could be listening to this episode of you and I talking today in a couple of years time. They listen to this episode and form that just sets something off in their head and they go on and change the world or they go on and do something great. And then their children go on and change the world and find the cure for cancer. It could happen. Absolutely. Uh, and, they, yeah. Human and, beings and, have such potential. Yeah. And like my focus now, like I do business coaching for podiatrists and some of the people that I've helped and seen what they've done with their businesses over the last few years, I sit back and just go, my God, you're like early thirties. I said, where your business is now is like miles ahead of where I was at the same age what are you going to do with this in, in years to come? Yeah. And it makes me feel really good knowing that they're doing far better than I ever did. Yeah. But, well, you, yeah. You saw, but you've helped them along that journey, which is great. No, there's a lot of gratification there. And, and a lot of the students there, they're really special. They'll come back and I'll see them at meetings and they'll bring up something that may have been said at a meeting when I, they were students. And I always tell students there's the 5% rule or 3% rule can be five. I tell them, look, here's the 3% rule. You're going to be working for 10 hours a day out on rotations. That's 600 minutes, right? 3% of that is 18, 18 minutes. If you come in early 18 minutes or stay late 18 minutes, or you do a little bit more than everybody else, they're going to remember you and you're going to get that residency program. So I'll be at a meeting, Tyson, and I'll have a student come up and say, oh my gosh, Dr. Jensen, I haven't seen you in 10 years. You're right. The 3% rule still works. <laughs> Ah, uh, that is so true. I was going to ask you for a final tip, but I think that is a perfect final tip. The the three percent right. rule, because I always say that to people: if you want to have a better business than the person down the road, you don't need to do one hundred percent more. You just need to do, you know, we'll say three percent, but ten percent more than what everybody else is doing, and you will stand out and you will grow, whether it's your business or whether it's your career. Yep. And then the funny part about that is if you stay 20 minutes more and then the doc has you over at the hospital working up a patient, you may be there for three more hours. It's so awesome and you're loving it. So yeah, I'd like that rule. Um, any rule that I feel like I can give my kids, I feel real comfortable giving to my students. Yeah, there was a, a public speaker. He was a professional speaker. And he said to me, the one tip he gave me that I thought was really good. He said, if you're ever speaking at an event, he said, turn up early. Ask if you can help. He said, stay behind afterwards, ask if you can help and, and be there to answer questions. Don't just rock in exactly when you're supposed to speak, do the talk and then bugger off. He said, if you're there and they can see that you're helpful and you're there afterwards and they can see that you really want to participate in whatever this group was, he said, you'll get invited back. 
Absolutely. It's a version so, of the 3% rule. Sounds it the is. same. It is the 3% <laughs> rule. So, Jeff, I want to thank you for coming on the Podiatry Legends podcast. This has been fun. Uh, I recommend people go and check out the Dean's Chat podcast. Go and have a listen, and it will help build your numbers up. But remember, come back here and still listen to the Podiatry Legends podcast. Don't leave us all alone. Absolutely. So. <laughs> uh, we'll get on and, and we'll pump the podcast for sure. And I talked to Jim McDonald about that too. So I look forward to that. Tyson, I'm so thankful that you invited me on the show and I'm so glad that we got to spend some time together. No, this has been fantastic. So thank you very much. All right. Cheers. Okay. Bye. <laughs> bye. -bye.